3.6 billion passengers use commercial flights every year. But getting from A to B can be quite a challenge. In this series, we'll witness the bizarre. I was thinking, what is going on? The bust-ups. As soon as he got within arm's reach of him, all hell broke loose. And on board terror. I just wanted to get out. All captured on camera <laughs> by travellers around the world. From check-in to the cabin. We'll watch the drama unfold. We didn't know if we were going to live or die. As passengers go crazy on a plane. Pretty crazy. This time, smoke engulfs the flight. Everybody's turning around looking at other people. You can see it in their eyes. Is anyone else panicking? Passengers kick off at check-in. All of a sudden, I was being arrested, and I still don't know why. Animals take over the airports. Very beautiful, Very soft. And the oxygen masks drop on two flights to Dallas. Is this real life? Like, what is going on? I just wanted to get out. This is the moment. A plane in mid-flight fills with smoke. All right, folks, I don't want to cause you any alarm, but I do have a smoke indication in the cabin. And the passengers discover that no oxygen masks are fitted. So if I can just get everyone to stay calm and breathe through your clothes. Canada. Vancouver Airport. Located on the edge of the city is separated by over 30 miles of freezing water from Nanaimo Airport on Vancouver Island. Robin Thacker and his wife live on the island and are on the final leg of their journey home after a holiday. The easiest and most convenient way to, to connect to Vancouver, we use aircraft it's because it's, it is such a convenience. The short hop across the freezing cold water normally takes about 30 minutes. I'd, be, I'd expect that to be as dangerous as taking a taxi. It's not, not anymore. It's a commonplace thing that we do. Having an incident is the furthest, furthest from your mind. You know, we're not even leaving sight of the ground. We're, we're, we're flying at 2,000 feet. It's not like it's high up in the air. The plane takes off. It's a normal flight, but over halfway across the strait, Robin smells something. We're over water, and that's actually when I started noticing uh, smell of smoke. I asked my wife if she got the smell, and of course she's looking at me, no, I, I can't catch any. No one else in the cabin was saying anything. So I thought, well, it's, it's just me, I'm tired. But Robin is correct. The cabin is slowly filling up with smoke. Off to my left, I heard the word smoke being conversed between a passenger and, so obviously someone else has a good sense of smell like I do, <laughs> and they picked it up. As other passengers slowly realise that something is wrong, the flight attendant makes an announcement. All right, folks, I don't want to cause you any alarm, but I do have a smoke indication in the cabin. The captain is going to give us more information. Unfortunately, I know as much as you guys do right now. So if I could just get everyone to stay calm. Now I'm afraid. Immediate. That was an immediate sense. I started looking, OK, what's going to happen if this escalates? You could tell now everyone's on the same alert mode that I'm on. We're all listening to the professional tell us what to do. But the next thing the flight attendant says is slightly concerning. Everyone just stay calm and breathe through your clothes. I immediately thought that the masks will drop out and then we'll breathe through them. I've learned later that these aircraft don't carry masks unless they're actually going to be flying about 25,000 feet. So please breathe through your clothes and also just keep those seatbelts fastened just in case we have to do an emergency landing. The aircraft is filling up with smoke. No one knows the source or whether it's a fire. And with no oxygen masks, passengers are having to breathe in the potentially toxic air. I will let you know as soon as I know, but unfortunately I know just as much as you guys do right now, so let's let the boys do their job. You can see it in their eyes, everybody's turning around looking at other people, and what we're looking for is, is 
Is anyone else panicking? Um, I'm not sure where it is coming from right now, but if you do see anything weird, just call us one of the, one of the girls and we'll come there right away. We're 2,000 feet above water. I actually looked out because I could see the wing and, and there's no floats. So I'm in the wrong type of aircraft. These aircraft have to land on, on, on land. If the plane ditches in the freezing water, it's not designed to float, which would give the passengers only 15 minutes before hypothermia sets in. Landing there, I know it's, it's highly improbable that we even survive. I'm sick to my stomach. Okay, this, this is it. It used to be that what happened on a flight stayed on a flight, but mobile phones put pay to that. So we've asked travel vloggers, pilots, former cabin crew and security experts to take a closer look at flights, fights and airport antics caught on camera. Cabin crew are meant to exhibit the highest standards of professionalism, but some fall short, very short. In China, an internal flight has landed and there is passenger food left over. Cabin crew are meant to recycle the food, but one can't help herself. This is, this is, this is bad, yeah. She's being filmed from an angle where she surely can see in her peripheral vision if somebody has a camera pointed at her or not, and it just seems like she doesn't care. I'm on board with that. 100%, because if you knew how much money flight attendants made and how difficult it is, I've done it. <laughs> I've totally done it. I've done it. Not really surprising, as in completely depends on the policy of the airline. Generally, the cabin crew will, will be seated in their jump seat with a tray with their meal, if only not to be filmed like this. <laughs> The flight attendant was suspended and the incident investigated by the airline. A flight to Dubai has just taken off, but a passenger in business class has spotted something strange. A flight attendant pouring unused liquid back into the bottle. I am absolutely outraged by this. It's really bad. I really hope that they haven't been serving that champagne to people. I mean, when you get that pre-flight glass of champagne in business class, to think that it might have come from used glasses, not very nice, really gross. Was this girl trying to pour it back so she could have it herself or give it to her mates or save it for later, or is the airline's protocol? You've just got to hope that whatever's being poured back doesn't have someone swilling it. It's not the dreg ends of somebody's glass. The airline undertook an internal investigation. $80,000, that's all? A flight is due to travel from Delhi to Hong Kong, but investigators have caught a flight attendant red-handed. This cabin crew member evidently felt that it was okay to smuggle a bunch of cash into her luggage and get away with it, which obviously didn't happen. There are people that believe that wrapping things in tin foil will allow things that they're transporting that they don't want to declare through security, and that is not a thing. <laughs> that's, that's an urban myth. <laughs> I can guarantee you somebody paid her to say, hey, you're a cabin crew member, you're the perfect person to do this for us. Um, nobody's going to check your stuff. Wrong. <laughs> She has nearly half a million dollars in cash, wrapped in silver foil. Officials believe the plan was to exchange it for gold and smuggle it back into the country, avoiding paying taxes. The flight attendant was arrested. This check-in is rammed with passengers. When frustration boils over, one family find themselves arrested. Miami, Florida in North America. A popular holiday destination. I was in Miami uh, for a birthday trip. 
I recently just graduated from Long Island University. Like, I was having like the best time of my life. Cinco de Mayo, J Day! Woo! Janice and her brother Desmond have been in town relaxing. We were down there for about a week. So while uh, we met up with friends, everything was great. At the end of their trip, they missed their flight back to New York and are rebooked onto a later flight that same evening. There was a lot of people uh, boarding the flight. Uh, we waited on the line to check our bags. What they don't know is that the airline is in dispute with its pilots and flights are being affected. Shortly before they're due to board, the airline announced that the flight is cancelled. They made an announcement saying that um, they won't be able to fly out to New York uh, due to reasons unknown. Everybody's not sure what to do, and it's mass chaos. A lot of people started to get upset, um, myself included. Janice, in the orange dress, starts berating the check-in staff. We weren't given any information on why it was canceled and when was going to be a new fly. With a large crowd at check-in, the police presence increases. Passengers are waiting to be rebooked. Eventually, Janice and Desmond, in the red hat, get to the front. We finally get to the front, and one of the managers for Spirit Airlines came to the counter, and he told us that our flight, that we're no longer Spirit customers anymore and that they will not given us any accommodations in regards to a flight and that they would refund our money. We're thinking to ourselves, how do I get home? Where are my bags? We already checked our bags. We have no information. I don't understand why out of everybody here, we're not able to get a ticket to go home. It was like they didn't care for us at all. But the brother and sister have attracted the interest of local sheriffs. We stand up there waiting for our refund and Shortly after, we were getting arrested. There was no um, standoff. There was no initial um, address of us being arrested or of us saying to calm down. I looked over my shoulder. They were then putting their arms on me. And then that turned out to what it came to be. An officer claims to hear both the brother and sister threaten the staff and challenge them to step outside for a fight. grabbed my brother, Desmond. I was really scared. I went towards my brother to, you know, to see if he was okay. And before I can come to him, another officer came. As I was looking up on the, from the floor, I was looking up, I seen her legs in the air. We didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't curse anyone. I didn't, you know, threaten anyone. I didn't put my hands on anyone. But the sheriffs are now in full arrest mode. I seen a lot of phones being pointed at me, so it was very intimidating. I, I felt like useless. I felt like I was no one. There was literally nothing I could do. All of a sudden, I was being arrested. Both Janice and Desmond are arrested and spend the night in police cells. I kept telling to myself, like, this has to be a dream. I went from having the time of my life in Miami for my birthday with my brothers, with my friends. That night, I'm in a jail cell. They both now face charges that include resisting an officer with violence and inciting to riot. They deny all charges, but if found guilty, they could each face five years in prison. I just have faith in the justice system that, you know, we will get our justice and we'll see to it. The airline issued a statement afterwards saying that they apologise for the disruption and that they are shocked and saddened by the events that took place. On every plane, there's always one person you can turn to. When they first appeared, they were recruited from the nursing profession and the concept behind their role remains safety. The selection process remains intense and rigorous, 
they are still the angels of the skies, on hand to serve, help and guide. But the cabin crew role, the passengers and the problems have all changed and the job is not what it was. So we've opened our confessional cabin and invited crew in to open up about the reality of flying. Oh, and some of their identities have been hidden to protect the innocent. Cabin crew travel the world and meet lots of people. They also sometimes see the strangest things. We were doing an internal flight in India and I went out with the tea and coffees and as I was walking down the aisle I got to this row of passengers and as I looked down there was a green kind of scruffy parrot sat on the meal tray eating the food and I kind of did a double take so I just couldn't believe my eyes how on earth has that bird got on this flight? It was his pet, it just sat on his meal tray with him and then he put it back in his pocket it wouldn't have been detected through a metal detector, that's for sure. I was asked once to just stow something and as a kiss. So what can I take? And he had to use leg. His false leg. And I had to kind of like, you know, keep a you know, professional face on. All of my colleagues were just literally in hysterics and I was walking down with this false leg with a shoe on the end. There's nothing worse than a passenger coming in, standing there, doing the stretches, getting into all different yoga positions and trying to stop themselves from getting DVT on a 30 minute flight. High above the water that separates Vancouver Island from the city. All right, folks, I don't want to cause you any alarm, but I do have a smoke in the kitchen in the cabin. Robin Thacker and his wife are sitting on a plane, filling up with smoke. I'm sick to my stomach. This, this is it. Everyone just stay calm and breathe through your clothes. The plane is near its destination, Vancouver Island, but currently still above freezing water and still filling up with smoke. It's filled with smoke. It's, it's, it's hard to breathe. The crew ready the passengers for a quick descent and emergency landing. The crew did mention we're doing an emergency landing, so make sure you're bracing and we're going to land. The plane has passed the water and ready to land on ground. But the emergency is far from over. I do remember him dropping the aircraft pretty quick. Once we felt those tires touch the ground, that was a good relief. Safely on the ground, the plane is still full of smoke and the source is still unknown. We're sitting there on the tarmac and we're not getting out. No one's opening doors. All right, everyone, please stay seated. I know this is a very uh, stressful situation, but the boys have everything in control up front. They are going to let us know if we need to emergency evacuate the airplane. If this ignites, because there's lots of smoke, it's going to do it in one shot. All it would have taken was one person to lose it, and that whole aircraft would have went into a frenzy. Enough's enough. We need to get out. Evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. Which side? Hurry up. Go, 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 go. Okay? Sorry. Yeah. Blow up. Go ahead. Go ahead. People start to evacuate, but the queue for the back exit, nearest to Robin, moves very slowly. We all assume there's going to be this nice slide or some kind of thing there. There's not. Passengers have to jump, or someone on the ground has to help lift passengers off. How long do you hold out before politeness goes by the wayside and, and uh, you start pushing and shoving? Ready? Eventually, Robin and his wife make it out of the aircraft and onto the tarmac. Yeah, you're okay. Thank you. Afterwards, the airline made a public statement but didn't reveal the source of the smoke. I believe it was a newspaper announcement just saying that they were glad that everyone was safe on the ground and that their, their crew performed as they were trained, which, which is good, but that's it. We didn't get anything from West yet. Across the world every day, millions of people jump on a flight. 
the cost of a plane ticket has more than halved since 1970. Low-cost airlines have made it even cheaper and opened up the skies to everyone. But there was a time when flying was a rare luxury. When getting on a plane was the pursuit of only the wealthy or businessmen. When planes had proper tables and the food was served silver service. And there's one British man who remembers that time well. Fred Finn has flown the most supersonic journeys ever and over 13 million commercial flight miles. Concord used to regularly fly between London and New York in three hours, three hours and a quarter. On board Concord, of course, you met many celebrities and I, I made a particular friend of Johnny Cash. We got along very well. I used to visit him in Nashville. We used to fly to New York together. We used to go out to dinner together in our little favorite restaurant, 61st and 3rd in New York. And they served the ribeyes that big or that big as we went through the door. And one of my flights down to Nashville, I met his wife, June Carter Cash. And June said, could you write John a little note and when are you going to come and see us? And so, OK. So I happened to have a bottle of Concord wine, which is obviously the best of the best. So I wrote a little note on the bottle. A little later on, hindsight being better than foresight, I realized that John was a reformed alcoholic and probably not the ideal gift to have sent to him. And Fred has a tip on how to keep in shape while jetting around the world. My next tip is about your own personal comfort. Use my aerial isometrics, which is exercising in your seat. Nobody will see you. It's not about jumping up and down in the aisle, running up and down the cabin and doing press-ups. This is flexing your muscles, clenching your fists, squeezing your toes, clenching your leg muscles. This keeps your body tone, and at the end of the day, it will help you to relax and enjoy your flight. people who find the idea of hurtling through the skies at 500 miles per hour in an aluminium can as somewhat scary. But some have found a way to deal with the fear. They bring with them a travel buddy, an emotional support animal. And on most US planes, travellers can bring almost any type of animal they want. This is Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Emotional support animals are a rising phenomenon in North America, and individuals are bringing all types of support. Individual passengers in the USA need a single document from a medical professional supporting their need for the animal. one lady has decided to support all passengers with a fear of flying by bringing animals to everyone. Meet Willie Nelson and Wendy. Twice a month, Lisa Mode brings her miniature horses to Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. Flying for a lot of people is very stressful. There's a lot going on to take care of. I'm, some people even have phobias about it. So, you know, we feel very strongly in support of having emotional support animals at airports. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. We're beautiful, soft. Beautiful. Horses is what I love, so that's what we use. And what our goal is when we come to the airport is to provide um, a calming effect for people, um, a, a time when they visit with the horses where they can kind of uh, relax, calm down, and then get ready to go on their flights. To know that you know I've made a difference in their day, even if, if, if it goes from being a little bit stressful to a little bit less stressful, it's worth my time to come out here and, and say hi to these people with my horses. Coming to the airport, I was very sick to my stomach, very nervous, my blood pressure's up, but running into these little guys has relaxed me quite a bit, and I think I might be able to actually step foot onto the plane. Lisa and her support horses never make it onto the plane. They do their work on the ground, making sure the passengers are calm and relaxed before boarding. I managed to break my tibia and fibula, so I've been in the hospital room 
for the past several days, and <laughs> this is the first thing I've been excited about in a while. There are over 5,000 public airports in North America alone. Lisa is hopeful that she's leading the way in creating calm on a plane. It would be great if, if there were more emotional support animals at, at the airports. So cute. It would just make flying a whole lot easier for a lot of people. Having passengers on board who are relaxed and ready to fly is great. But as the flight crew in our confessional cabin know, that doesn't necessarily stop them from asking silly questions. The most stupid things that passengers have ever said to God, there's, there are hundreds. There's quite a few things that were annoying about passengers. I was just landed into Atlanta, which was like a 14 hour or something flight. And then someone goes, as they're getting off the aircraft, see, are you going back now? Do you fly back? No, I've just worked for 14 hours. I'm not going to work for 28, you know. Passengers have asked, what's that noise? And when you tell them it's the engines, well, is there any way you can turn it off? It's too loud, I'm trying to sleep. Passengers asking, can we turn back? I've left the iron on. How do the slides reach the ground when we're up at 35,000 feet? So they thought that there's a 35,000 foot slide that you slide down should there be an emergency. I've had passengers ask me where the runways are in the sea in case if there was an emergency when you're flying over open water. I think passengers leave their, their brains in the terminal or at home. So watch what you say when you're next on board. Please remove the safety information card from the seat pocket. Helping the passengers to feel relaxed and comfortable on a flight is part of the cabin crew remit. And some like to set the tone for the flight at the very start. Slide the metal end into the buckle. Adjust by pulling on the loose end of the straps and lift up on the buckle top to release. It is our policy that you keep your seatbelt fastened at all times while seated. An internal flight in the USA, and this United flight attendant has found a novel approach to the safety briefing. Exit sign overhead. There are two doors in the front of the aircraft, the door through which you entered on the left, and the galley service door located on the right. There are two overwing exits. This type of thing can happen when someone hears the same safety briefing day after day after day. Thank you for your attention. Another internal flight in the USA, and this safety briefing has taken the performance level up a notch. Virgin America flights no longer operate, but hopefully this flight attendant has taken his skills to another airline. You have a good angle of me? You're getting a good angle? Okay, hold on. <laughs> this flight attendant has developed his passenger briefing into a comedy act. So, on the back of the wall, there's a large one that says the word flush and then it says the word press in English. So please push that button every single time, okay? Every single time. For some of you, push it twice. <laughs> you know who you are, I'm not judging. Just do what you gotta do. Afterwards, there's he a He warns the passengers about the service they can look forward to. Above you see, there's a real light air vent and a picture of a bump with the flight attendant on it. However, just recently we have been rated once again as the worst airline for customer service in the United States. So I wouldn't bother pushing that button. That's right, thank you, thank you, yes. We're the best at the worst, okay? <laughs> and gets everyone flight ready. Also, maybe a little bumpy when we take off. So if you do get nervous about turbulence, or if you get anxieties, I just want to let you know now so you get started. In the USA alone, on average, there are over 43,000 flights every day, taking around 2.5 million passengers to their destination. Most passengers will never experience an incident. But what happens when you find yourself in a mid-flight emergency? We didn't know if we were going to live or die. Avid traveller Josh Tremberger 
and his friend, Glenn Ickleberger, have been in Colorado visiting the Rocky Mountain National Park. What do you think? It's a beautiful view. It was a good time to decompress and get away from work and relax for a while. Exploring done. They're on flight 861, heading from Denver to Dallas. The flight started off very, very normal. There was no turbulence, and about uh, an hour into the trip... A ding went off half a dozen times in rapid succession, um, which kind of alerted me to something unusual. 30 seconds after that happened, um, the oxygen masks deployed. The air at high altitudes is thin and oxygen levels very low. So cabins are pressurized to maintain an oxygen level that passengers can easily breathe. Oxygen masks deploy when there's a sudden loss of this cabin pressure. The cabin crew start going through the cabin with uh, portable oxygen masks on their face but they were going through the cabin making sure everyone had their masks on correctly. You kind of pause for a second and you're looking at it and you're just like, is this real life? Like, what is going on? Oxygen masks are only designed to last 10 to 15 minutes. If the plane is not at the correct altitude by then, everyone is in danger. The pressures inside the cabin were just going crazy. It wasn't a pop, it was like bang, 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 just like in your eardrums. The feeling like your head was gonna explode. It was probably the longest 10 or 15 minutes of my life. We didn't know if we were gonna live or die. With Josh fearing for his life, the pilot drops the plane to a safe altitude. We're about 10, 15 minutes away from Dallas. Everything seems okay. They said we could take off the oxygen mask. The plane finally reaches Dallas. In movies, they make a heroic landing and everyone just cheers and goes crazy and goes wild, but it was very silent. No one was injured on the flight, but the experience is one that has had a profound effect on Glenn. The one thing it has taught me is how precious every moment is that we have on this planet. Josh and Glenn aren't the only passengers to experience the oxygen masks deploying on a flight to Dallas. But Marty Martinez's flight ended in tragedy. There was a hole that was on the side of the plane. Everybody on that plane was under the impression that we were all going down. back with our travel specialists, casting their expert eyes over the weird and wonderful world of flying, caught on camera. When you enter an airport, the laws of the land do not change. But some passengers forget this and wrongly think they can do what they want and behave how they want. A flight from Dubai has just landed at Heathrow Airport and the police have been called. They're marching down one way and the next thing you know, they're marching back the other way with a guy in tow. Fuck you! I resist. They drag him from economy through the curtain. Why are you fucking dragging me? I resist you. He's saying he's not resisting, but he's contradicting himself by swearing vile language at these police officers. This person is not escorted off because he is foul mouth. There has been issues with this person already. His best bet would have been to keep quiet. This is an aircraft, so there's no fighting against the authority here. This is not a democracy. Quite a few airlines have what's called blacklists where passengers are not ever being able to fly on this airline or potentially any connected airline in the future. So there's going to be you going on a bus somewhere on vacation for the rest of your life if you're doing this. The man was found guilty of being drunk, spitting and assault. He was given a suspended sentence, 220 hours of community work and ordered to pay compensation and costs totaling over £1,000. A flight heading to Dublin in Ireland. One passenger has had too much to drink and decides to use the back of the plane as his personal punch bag. 
Well, what we've got here is a passenger who is clearly under the influence of alcohol or drugs. But of course, we can't have anyone standing, dancing around without their shirt on. And it's a big guy. It looks like he's well worked out. So he could potentially cause some really serious damage if we would start to kind of go completely ballistic. As cabin crew, you'd want to try to at least converse and see what the situation is, assess everything, and then go from there. The cabin crew that normally is in the back of the aircraft is not there, which would indicate that they have tried to reason with this person. They have not succeeded. The flight diverted to Denmark, where the man was arrested. This couple also don't know how to behave on a flight. They've decided to use the rear seats as their love nest. Oh my god. Okay. Well, there's like no shame involved. At least could you be bothered to like walk to the back like a proper mile high club member and go to the lavatory and close the door. That's it. <laughs> it's easy. You don't see that every day. I mean, people might sneak to the toilets or something, but this is in full view of everyone on that plane. Loads of people seem to have this fantasy about the Mile High Club and sex on a plane, but it just seems like the most unromantic place ever. I'm kind of hoping there's no children about watching, but they've really taken the biscuit with that one. Marty Martinez is on a flight to Dallas when an explosion results in the cabin losing pressure. There was a hole that was on the side of the plane. And the oxygen masks deploy. Everybody on that plane was under the impression that we were all going down. Marty often visits New York City. It's a trip that I really make um, quite a few times a year. I travel about 30, 35 times um, each calendar year. Flight 1380 has just taken off from LaGuardia Airport in New York when it suffers an in-flight failure on the left engine. About 20 minutes in, we heard a loud explosion. And moments later, all of the oxygen masks on the plane deployed. And within five seconds, we heard another loud boom. And this explosion was uh, a lot louder than the first one. The cabin has suddenly lost pressure, but that is not the only danger. At that point, there was a hole that was on the side of the plane. As you can imagine, chaos ensued. The plane was uh, shaking pretty violently. Marty quickly puts his mask on, incorrectly. People were screaming, um, scrambling to put on their oxygen masks. The mask should be placed over both the nose and the mouth. This all happened so fast, I didn't have a, a, I didn't even have a moment to really um, make an assumption about what was going on. Pretty sure everybody on that plane really was under the, the impression that we were all going down. Terrified, he can think of only one thing. All I can think about was, um, you know, getting a message to the outside world. I had no idea if I had, you know, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, or 20 minutes left on that plane and whether we were going to land safely or not. I, I remember I just wanted to get out, um, you know, to my family and tell them that I loved them, you know, that I was proud of them. And I was just, that was the message that I wanted to get out. Amazingly, as the plane is in full emergency, Marty is able to go live on Facebook. We all uh, fall victim of this, of getting too busy with work and too busy with our own lives that um, sometimes we neglect um, the people that matter most to us. You know, once I gained access online, you know, I, I immediately felt like I had to get the word up out about what was happening on the flight. After a short while, a call goes out over the intercom. It was the flight attendant saying that, um, instructing everyone to uh, brace themselves for landing, saying in a very panicked voice, brace yourself, brace yourself, brace yourself, brace for landing, brace for landing. 
Finally, the wheels of the plane touch down. It was at that point when the airplane completely stopped. Did you hear just a sigh of relief in the cabin and people crying and, and, and clapping that, um, you know, we lived and, you know, we're able to walk away and, and talk about it. Sadly, one passenger whose window was blown out died from the injuries they sustained. It was like the most terrifying um, experience that, that I've ever had. It's uh, certainly changed my perspective on, on life and, you know, I even catch myself when I get upset about, you know, things that uh, really don't matter in the long run. But Marty knows that there was one reason why he survived the in-flight emergency. That flight crew really helped get us home. And, you know, hats off to the pilot. I think many of us um, really feels that we owe our lives to her. So if you're ever out there and you're, and you're watching this, thank you. Stag dudes have a reputation for outlandish behavior. And with many stag trips requiring a flight to somewhere, that behavior can be seen at airports. This British stag has arrived at the first stage of security. But his mates have printed him a massive boarding pass. <laughs> <laughs> the guard is happy to let this stag try to get through by himself. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you have to come over and see me. <laughs> Before stepping in to make sure he makes his flight. Thank you very much. This American stag is at the second stage of security. The bag check. And something has come up. I don't ask questions. I don't ask questions around here. That's your business. But the water is too large to go. All right. Um, your other device here is fine. I'm just going to separate the two. Appreciate that. Maybe. <laughs> Obviously, it isn't permitted to take liquids through security. Everything else is fine. <laughs> Finally, at the gate, this stag might think he's had a fairly easy ride to his flight. Aside from the outfit he's been made to wear. But this is about to change. His mates have booked him on a later flight, so he has to wait. Oh, don't worry, you got your luggage, mate. At the airport. <laughs> no doubt they'll have a few more surprises when he eventually joins them. Everyone waiting. Cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. <laughs> We've seen fights, fear, and furry friends. With air travel on the rise, more passengers mean more problems. And more problems can lead to more people going crazy on a plane. I'm